So, good afternoon. Five minutes fast hour. Let's get started. Um, in my session, I'm going to talk about user account and authorization server and the experiences we made at SAP. My name is Martin de Boer. I'm working as a product owner in the security and crypto topic for SAP. Okay, a little bit closer. Um, we have been working as a platform security team for many years, and since one and a half years, we're looking into the topic UAA and how can we make it usable for applications. So let me shortly introduce SAP. So SAP has helped hundreds of thousands of businesses to take advantage of technology. We started in the 1970s, starting with R1, evolving over R2, R3 to the cloud business. Um, and one of the pieces uh, of cloud business is HCP Cloud Foundry, which is using Cloud Foundry as a baseline. SAP means 76% of the world transaction revenue every day is passing through an SAP system. And uh, while we have a very solid rock inside on-premise deployments, um, also cloud customers uh, are getting very relevant for SAP. So in 2015, we roughly made 2 billion revenue in the cloud. So what I'm going to talk about today, I have three topics for you. First of all, for those who don't know the details, I'll give an introdu introduction about Cloud Foundry user account and authorization server. Then talk about um, how can you make it useful for applications, so what mechanisms do we have to integrate UAA into business applications, and at the third topic, I would explain what we have done at SAP to simplify integration and make using the UAA really easy. So let's start with UAA. What is the UAA? The UAA is within Cloud Foundry, the central place where users and authorizations are managed. Um, so that means if a user, for instance, logs into the platform using the CF login command, what's happening is uh, this user is prompted for credentials, usually using password, and then these credentials are sent, to, uh, are sent to the UAA. The UAA will validate, will issue a token, which then can be used to call different Cloud Foundry components. The UAA is very strong when it comes to REST APIs. So there are lots of APIs for managing the different entities known inside the UAA. It is rather restricted when it comes to user, uh, user APIs. So uh, the UAA, it has, API, uh, it has an admin UI for logging in, but otherwise it doesn't really have a rich set of uh, admin UIs. One of the aspects that makes it very interesting for application development is the support of multi-tenancy. So usually you don't see it a lot as, using, as being used in Cloud Foundry itself, but um, the UAA has support for multi-tenancy and also I'm going to explain um, what that means. So let's start at authentication. The UAA has different kind of uh, mechanisms for authentication. So uh, the first thing it has is an internal user store. That means using this internal user store, um, you can authenticate with password against that store. And uh, the users in that user store can be grouped hierarchically to assign authorizations to that user. Um, as a management API, there is a SKIM API, which is an internet standard for uh, managing users and groups, and that's also supported by the UAA. But the UAA is also pretty good when it comes to integration in common enterprise standards. For instance, there is a support of LDAP. So LDAP is a common protocol, for instance, supported by Microsoft Active Directory. So if you have Microsoft Active Directory, you can 
authenticate your users using username and password against Active Directory. Um, you can do a mapping of LDAP groups to the UAA groups again. And as a managed API, management API, you would directly use uh, the LDAP protocol. So when, when it comes to enterprise requirements, um, the UAA sometimes has some challenges for you. So for, for instance, when authenticating with the internal UAA users, um, you can put the password policy, but uh, the UAA, for instance, has no forced change of, uh, of a password. So assume you have a password policy that uh, requires to change a password every 30 days. Then after 30 days, the users will get locked and uh, the user need to get the, uh, the email password reset flow to get going again. Another protocol that's supported by the UAA is the SAML2 protocol, uh, also very well known in the enterprise environment. Um, with the SAML2 protocol, if you hit the UAA, you can select a link. I want to log on with my favorite SAML identity provider. Then the browser would get redirected to the SAML identity provider and then authenticate using the methods supported by the SAML identity provider. Um, similar, so um, with authorization, so if your SAML identity provider has a mechanism of grouping users, then uh, you can also map these SAML user groups to your UAA groups. Last protocol that's supported for authentication by the UAA is the OpenID Connect protocol. This is feature-wise very similar to uh, SAML2, but um, rather adopted in the cloud world um, by cloud identity providers. <coughs> what does it mean when you have enterprise requirements like strong authentication? So um, the UA itself, it doesn't have something like pluggable authentication. That means if you have requirements to support a, a certain kind of authentication, um, then you need to delegate it to one of the standard mechanisms supported by the UAA. So in our environment, we have the requirement for strong authentication. And uh, luckily, we have a SAML2 identity provider that supports so uh, strong authentication. And so what we do is uh, any kind of authentication needs to be delegated to that uh, SAML identity provider. For web applications, this is rather easy because it's just a redirect to my SAML identity provider. However, when it comes to integration with the command line uh, option, then uh, you need to go through CF login minus SSO. This will write a URL to the UAA where you can then authenticate. And if this is configured to support authentication using your SAML2 identity provider, SAML2 identity provider can prompt for two-factor authentication. Then you get a passcode which you copy into your command line and are then authenticated towards Cloud Foundry. So, multi-tenancy. Um, so, in application development, multi-tenancy frequently is uh, a very important feature if you want to share a certain set of resources. So, assuming you have backend services which are tenant aware, then um, you can make use of, uh, you can share these resources across multiple tenants. So, um, the UAA, it has a concept of identity zones. And an identity zone is uh, something that has own users, own OAuth clients, own groups, own identity providers. And it is addressed using zone.login.yourcf uh, domain. So that means if I now have a have an application and um, assume I have two customers on that application. If I then make sure that one customer gets redirected to the UAA with customer1.login.whatsoever, 
and the other customer gets uh, customer two dot uh, login, etc. Then um, I'm making use of the multi-tenant features of the UAA. I get a JSON web token issued, for instance, and this contains the information about my identity zone, and then the backend application can uh, make use of that and separate, uh, for instance, to, uh, to separate database tables. So now um, I explained what about uh, what functionalities are offered by the UAA. How do we integrate that into an application? And for application integration, there are essentially two protocols that are supported by the UAA. Um, the first protocol is using the OAuth protocol and JSON Web Tokens. And the second protocol is using SAML2. So let's look at uh, OAuth and how to use that for integration into web application. So with OAuth2, I have different entities. So um, I have a resource owner. This is the one who's owning access to a certain set of resources. So usually it's a user. And then I have an OAuth client. Usually this is my application that does something on behalf of a user. Then I have an authorization server. The authorization server is the component that authenticates the user and which has the capability also to issue a token which is then sent for authentication to the resource server. So from a user perspective, how does it look? Um, I have a user, that's my resource owner, and this user is now going to access, uh, to access an application. This application is uh, then redirecting the user to the authorization server, which is the UAA. The authorization server, it does certain checks, and uh, it will authenticate the user, and also in OAuth, um, there's a term of a scope. A scope is a permission for a user to access one or more resources. So, assuming everything went, went fine, then um, the UAA is redirecting the browser to the application, and the application will now take the client ID and client secret. It has registered as an OAuth client. We'll talk to the UAA, <coughs> and the UAA is going to issue an access token. Now the application received this access token, and um, this access token can then be used to access backend services <coughs> and sending this access token as an HTTP header. So in our world, this is usually a Node.js or a Java application, could also be other kind of applications. Okay. The other option of integrating is uh, by using the SAML2 protocol. So what has recently been added uh, to the UAA is the capability to act as an identity provider. And when acting as an identity provider, user would access the application, it would get redirected using the SAML service provider protocols to the UAA. The UAA would authenticate the user, issue a SAML assertion, and this SAML assertion would then be sent back to the application and the application validates the SAML assertion, assuming everything is fine, authenticates the user. So essentially these are the two protocols that are supported by UAA. So either taking the OAuth protocols or taking the SAML2 protocols. So um, what do we do? <laughs> to simplify integration. And there on our side, we have some boundary conditions. 
and the boundary conditions is um, we cannot give developers any kind of uh, more or less restricted access to the UAA. So that means um, our developers should be should have the permission to create OAuth clients, but um, when it comes to access to the UAA, you need to be very careful not to give uh, developers too, met, too much permissions. So if you grant them the permission, for instance, to create OAuth clients, um, then they also could create an OAuth client having the admin permission, which you probably don't want to do. And therefore, um, we need to be very restrictive on the permissions we're giving to developers. Um, another point is uh, we're using OAuth 2 for microservices, so that means we rely on these uh, JSON web tokens and inside uh, our applications, our backend applications, we do an offline validation of the JSON web token. Um, yeah. Another point is we need to have very simple application integration. So it should not be that every application needs to invent this uh, OAuth protocols themselves. Instead, there should be a component for doing that. Um, then from SAP history, uh, for long times we had the approach <coughs> that um, an application should declare the permissions it's going to check. So it should not be buried somewhere inside the coding. Experience is make, it, uh, make a declaration and it gets much easier to handle. So how do we do that? Um, our approach is uh, to come up with a service broker. So we have a service broker for integrating applications with the UAA. And uh, the second piece is um, we have an application router as a standard OAuth client, which we recommend to all of our applications. So what does the service broker do? Um, essentially, applications uh, need to define their artifacts. So they need to define what are the scopes we're using for functional authorization checks, what are the attributes we're using for instance-based authorizations, um, and then this is what needs to be passed uh, to the service broker. And the mechanism we're using for that is to use the service broker parameters. So that means um, our applications, they generate a service instance, and then they pass a so-called security JSON, which contains the information about scopes, attributes, etc. So the service broker will generate an OAuth client, and the service broker will take control and governance about the scopes that this application is able to request. So therefore, for instance, if an application comes and says, uh, we would like to have the UA admin scope, no chance, we won't do that. So how does it look from development perspective? Uh, assuming I have my developer and this developer wants to develop an events application. And he says, okay, I want to have something like an event reader. I want to have an event manager. And um, so he defines the role templates in this X security JSON. He will define, I need to have a scope to read events and to have a scope to comment events. Similar event manager gets these events. Additionally, the event manager gets a scope for managing ev and events. And because the event manager, that one needs to be um, able to differentiate between different countries. Therefore, we'll define an attribute country. Then we can define an, a role event reader, um, which is similar to the role template because it doesn't have any attributes. And for the event manager, I we'll have an event manager DE for Germany, which has a country attribute DE. Similar, we have an event manager US, with a country value US. 
So this is uh, what applications need to pass to our service broker, and then service broker takes care of creating the OAuth clients, managing all these, uh, all these role templates, for instance, to a SAML group. <coughs> the other um, component which we provide to applications uh, is the application router. So um, application router probably could also be implemented using uh, the routing services, um, but we didn't have a closer look into that yet. Um, so essentially what the application router does is, um, this is the component um, that acts as our OAuth client. So that means, um, it very well integrates with our service broker, taking uh, the service binding, taking the, the data from the credentials of the service binding, and then um, if a request hits the application router, the application router will check, has this user been authenticated? If it has not been authenticated, it will send the user to the, uh, to the UAA for authentication, and um, to enforce authentication. What the application router additionally does is um, it will act as a reverse proxy, sending the request to our resource servers. And we have put uh, some additional security functionalities inside the application router. One is CSRF protection, so um, a request that comes from the browser needs to have a certain HTTP header set, otherwise it will not pass the application router. Um, and also um, what we do is, uh, our intention is that this JSON web token never leaves application router or resource servers. So that means, um, the user agent here is going to establish a security session, but it will not pass. Um, it will not pass the, uh, the tokens to the application router itself or to the browser. Good. Um, advanced topics. So um, these JSON web tokens, they're nice but sometimes you get to the limits. One of the limit is uh, if an application is using a lot of functional authorizations, so then uh, this JOT token will grow in size and um, what we have experienced in our Cloud Foundry environment is that there's a, a limit of eight kilobytes, so as soon as you're beyond that limit, uh, um, the JOT token is being blocked by the CF router. Uh, I mean, you can work around that, but still, um, at some point in time, you will get beyond that size. Um, and um, therefore, um, what we're looking into currently is uh, two ways. So if you have one, um, one application calling another uh, microservice, then uh, what you'll see as a requirement is either um, this service requires a different set of scopes. I don't want to forward my tokens, so I need to have the functionality to, to request new tokens. And for that, there is a, it's, it's a, called the non-standard OAuth authorization code supported by UAA, which allows you doing so. Um, the other thing is sometimes you have applications that need to do something in the background. You know, they, some house, householding activities, for instance. And um, for that, you need to have a technical user. And um, what we're using for that is um, the OAuth client can either do something on behalf of the user. This is how you usually know it. But also, there's a thing called client credential flow where the OAuth client can act on, on its own behalf. So, and so this is what we're using for technical user communication. 
So we started with uh, UAA one and a half years ago. So first looking into trying to understand it, having the feeling we find something new every day. Um, in the meantime, we, uh, we start contributing back. So what we already did is uh, contribute an attribute API for getting attributes into the UAA. Then there were contributions about vulnerable library versions. Um, what we're currently working on is, uh, is the OAuth SAML bearer flow. This is if you have server-to-server -server communication and you need to authenticate the user with SAML uh, assertion without um, using a browser. Yeah? Um, and in the SAP area, this is a very popular flow. Then performance improvements. So uh, at some places, UAA is making a lot of SQL communication, which uh, needs to be improved. And so working also on that one. And what we have as corporate requirement is uh, we need to support a password change dialogue. Uh, this is also something we'll contribute back to UAA. <coughs> Coming to the summary. So what we found is UAA can also be used for authentication, authorization of business applications, especially when making use of the identity zone, multi-tenancy features of the UAA. Authentication, authorization, if you know the boundary conditions, this is all included inside the UAA, but to make it really usable for application integration, you need to have a service broker. Otherwise, uh, it's very difficult to maintain all the entities inside the UAA. With that, I'd like to thank you and open up for questions. Yeah. Um, you showed the slides that um, the UAA um, <coughs> internal storage or LDAP or OAuth and some it's also possible to implement the other identity provider. Is there an API to... No, this is the topic, uh, pluggable authentication, which is not available. So we have done that to, to authenticate against our HANA database. So it is possible, but uh, you really need to dig into that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the question, the question was, uh, is it possible to plug in a different user store? Yeah, and the standard user stores, LDAP, SAML2, OpenID Connect, etc. This is all supported but there's no API for plugging in another custom data store. My questions. So, uh, question is uh, multi-factor authentication. So, in the UAA, for default, there is no type authentication. So, it means the only way of doing that is to delegate another identity provider. Then you have the choice 
sum of two of my And uh, then we need to, so at SAP we have a product called Sapphire Identity, which supports this uh, two factor authentication using, using a password and then a code that uh, gets generated by mobile device. And uh, the trick is, I mean, for web applications, it's quite straight away. Straight away. If you want to do it for the command line interface, uh, Foundry has this option minus SSO. The CF login minus SSO, which will then print the uh, URL of the UAA, which you can access to get the code. More questions? Okay, otherwise, thanks a lot, and I'll be around for some more.